Did you already see the cell phone warning? He changed. Uh oh. Hold on, Pastor Miller. Do they need to see this? Do you want the streamers to see the picture down there? Okay, well, in other words, it's going to be there a while. It's not meant for the service. Hey, Anna. All right. As you can see from the handout, we're going to get into a study of the second week of the month on Bible prophecy. This week, we're going to talk about what we call pre trip persecution. We're going to call the series Charting the End Times. And we'll come back to that in just a minute. So we'll go ahead and open the word of prayer, and then we'll get into our current events, which is related to our study. And uh, ask Charlie if you would to open the Bible study prayer. Dear Lord, we praise you and thank you for this day. And thank you for just letting each of us get out of bed this morning and go back to the business that we had. And thank you for letting us eat your right here safely. I pray that you would help us to just be mindful of the many blessings you bestow on us every day and the fact that we can have food to eat, clothes to put on, and just all the all the little things that we don't even think about that are in our day to day. Thank you for that. I pray that you would just help us to understand your word and help us to, every day, even when we're not coming to church, that you would help us to be mindful what you've done for us and uh, that it is a reasonable service to, uh, to study and know this word and, uh, to serve you and to lay down our lives for you as, as you've done for us. You've saved us from our, our, uh, the eternity that we've earned and given us a, gifts beyond we, anything that we can imagine. And I pray you just bless this service and uh, continue to protect us as we leave here tonight. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Just might close that door to keep the air in. Don't. Just want to get five priests warmer in here in five minutes. No. All right. Uh, for the events of the day, we're going to start with that. It's related to the study we're going to have. And uh, we're talking about pre trib persecution. The reason we call it that is because uh, the tribulation period is the seventh week of Daniel, the last seven years. When that begins is when the Antichrist confirms the covenant um, with Israel and with the nations, uh, allowing Israel to build a temple and offer sacrifice. It will be Mosaic law for one more week of years. 69 weeks ended when Messiah was cut off, and the 70th week is yet to come. And um, the... The reason this uh, study is important is because there are a lot of people who think that because we believe in a pre-trip rapture, wherein the saints, the body of Christ is raptured before that, that we believe that persecution can't happen. And I guess evidently they think it's for America. American Christians can't be persecuted before the rapture. Totally absurd. <laughs> There's no Bible for that. There's no basis for that. Approaching the rapture, though, we see the predicted increase in what we call anti-Christian persecution. Try to you hand them a couple of these. I don't think they've got the, the chart. And uh, the uh, the fact is that. What we're seeing right now, not just based on the rapture, or relating to the rapture, but relating to everything that's about to happen, we see the stage being set. Israel being regathered in the land since 1948 in a big way. Um, the preparations for the building of the temple, temple artifacts, the Temple Mount Institute, you can look it up online, um, the Sodomite revival, Jesus said, um, as we approach that last seven-week period, it would be as it was in the days of Lot and as it was in the days of Noah. 
And uh, I don't think anybody needs any real proof that that's taking place. <laughs> and so the, along with that, as we approach the rapture, we see an increase in this anti-Christian persecution. Here, this is a headline from uh, a news source online called Christian Headlines. Persecution of Christians meets the definition of genocide. That's a report from the British government. Now, that's worldwide. It's not in America. But worldwide, the persecution of Christians is meeting the global definition for genocide that was established many years ago. The uh, report says that uh, it was prepared for the British government and it was released publicly. It says Christianity is by far the most widely persecuted religion and recommends the government become the worldwide leader in promoting religious liberty. So these are Brits and the British government is being called upon to become a leader in protecting religious liberties. Um, the report says, quote, how grave does this situation have to become before we act? My answer is, it's just going to get worse. Happy days are here again. You know. But that's just the truth. And um, Jeremy Hunt, uh, the British Secretary of State for Foreign and Commonwealth Affairs, um, is the uh, person who I think was commissioned, yeah. And they they have basically a church state set up over there with the Anglican Church. So they have this Reverend, right Reverend Philip Mont Stephen, and Bishop, he's the Bishop of Truro, uh, released the report. And it was released back in May. And you may have noticed if you watch the news that there wasn't much talk about it. Now we are warned in the Bible not to be ignorant. But because people have a false idea of what church is supposed to be, they're ignorant. <laughs> because when they go to church, they're not being taught anything. Uh, some churches, it's an exercise in, um, you know, it, well, you might call it an exercise in exercise. <laughs> and it's like running around, you know, oh, you know speaking in tongues, get the same spirit and all that. <laughs> And in other places, it's uh, it's more calm and relaxed, but you just, all, all your, you know, I think they should all just adopt the Beatles song as their theme song. All you need is love. Wah, wah. You know? <laughs> and that's not Bible either. The Bible says that we are not to be in darkness, we're not to be ignorant, and we're told in Hosea 4, 6, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And you need examples of that. Just uh, go back and read church history and history in general. What happened in Germany was that most of the Christians were very lukewarm, and they didn't see what was coming. And they had bad theology, so they didn't care about the Jews being mistreated. And one thing led to another. Uh, we did a study uh, many moons ago, but I showed the documentation that um, what we call positive thinking in America today started with the Nazis and the Nazis set up a fake church a false church and it was all positive and a message wasn't about you being a sinner and need to be saved by Jesus it was a message of you know you know we got this wonderful um, Leader, the third Führer, and uh, mm -hmm. and we're going to experience the Third Reich and have a, a thousand years of peace. And it was all just about how positive everything was supposed to be. And that's what's happening in America today. Everything's supposed to be positive, positive, positive. You're never supposed to speak about what's really going on because there's so much negative. But the thing is, what you always have to remember is for all the negative information you hear, the positive is in this book. Amen. The positive is that as wicked and sinful as this world is, there's coming a kingdom of righteousness. Amen. Jesus will be king. And all this wickedness and sin that's going on, on an individual level, every individual sinner on planet Earth can be saved. If they will repent toward God with faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ, 
believing how that Christ died for their sins, was buried and rose again. If they reject that, then they choose to go to hell. But that negative doesn't need to even happen. There's no reason for anybody to go to hell. The remainder of our study will tell us the rest of the story, <laughs> as Paul Harvey would say. So let's get right into it. Charting the end times, and you have uh, those of you who are in attendance here tonight, those of you who are watching online, maybe you can go to bbfohio.com under resources, Bible charts, and you can download your own copy of this pre trib persecution chart. Let's read in John 16 to begin Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. <coughs> Sixteen, beginning around in verse one, Jesus says, "These things have I spoken unto you, that ye should not be offended." And that means that you would, won't stumble. Now, a lot of Christians today stumble because of ignorance, because of lack of knowledge. Now, beginning verse two and three, read that with me. They shall put you out of the synagogue. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. And these things will they do unto you, because they have not known the Father or me. So a thing to look for as we approach the end are a bunch of religious people who hate Christians and want to kill you. That's right. <laughs> That's what it says. Now, it also, though, uh, notice it makes direct reference to the synagogue. Why? Because this has a dual application. It's not only Jesus is talking about Christians throughout church history, but the reason he says synagogues is because after the rapture, God's back to dealing with the Jews. In those 69 weeks of Daniel, and I encourage anybody who didn't see our study Go online, bbfi.com, or Daniel Studies. And I recommend you go through the whole book with us. But Daniel 9, 24 to 27, we did several studies on that. And you understand more of what we're talking about. But the basic idea is that there were 69 weeks that ended with Messiah being cut off. That was Jesus dying on the cross. There's one seven-year period remaining. And that is after the rapture of Christians... That's why it says they will they shall put you out of the synagogues. Because it's back to God dealing with the Jews. Now, how could the wicked think that they serve God by persecuting and killing Christians? That's what we call counterintuitive. You think, wait a minute, if I'm going to serve God, I should be a Christian. If I'm going to serve God, I should be get along with Christians. I should be helpful to Christians, right? Well, we already have seen this in history many times. One major example is the Inquisition. The Roman Catholic Church killed millions of people in the name of God. The Roman Catholic Church would uh, find out you were having a Bible study in your home, and they would uh, come in and take everybody in there and take them into uh, basements and dungeons, and they would put you on the rack, and they would torture you to confess to all kinds of crimes and things that you didn't you know, even do, and then they would hand you over to the civil government who would kill you. Most of the time they would set you on fire and burn you alive. Other times they would strangle you. Uh, other times they would rip your guts out and let you bleed to death. And uh, most Christians today, not only do we not suffer that, but uh, a lot of people just are too happy and properly even read Fox's Book of Martyrs to see what happens. I'm not kidding you. I, we handed out Fox's Book of Martyrs. We, I think we have a copy here. If not, we're going to have a copy. I just got a smaller copy, real cheap, but uh, into the uh, library. We handed them out to the whole church. And all these guys, and what kills me is the Christians, a lot of them will go home and watch movies where people are shot up and cut up and raped. and They'll play video games where people are getting blown to bits and everything. And then you hand them a book, Fox's Book of Martyrs. Oh, I can't read that. That's just a, a little sidebar there on how ridiculous this generation has become. 
but that's why they're ignorant. They can't read anything like that, so they don't even know that our Christian brothers and sisters for six centuries were killed in the name of God by the Roman Catholic Church under the direction of the Pope and the Grand Inquisitor. Now, right now, today, four of the five worst nations where persecution is taking place are Islamic. They're doing it in the name of God. They're killing people and persecuting people in the name of God. Afghanistan, number two. Number three, Somalia. Number four, Libya. Number five, Pakistan. And number one is North Korea, the uh, communist regime. Well, number six, eight, and nine, Islam. Number six is Sudan. Number eight is Yemen. Number nine is Iran. So uh, number seven is Eritrea. It's uh, a dictator's nuts, kind of like North Korea. And in India, it's just religious nationalism, and a, it's a political thing, killing people who don't agree with their politics. Then, 11 through 15, all Islamic. Syria, Nigeria, Iraq, Maldives, Saudi Arabia, 12 of the 15 worst nations on the planet persecuting Christians are Islamic. Oh, China. They're not the top 15. And these 12 of 15 Islamic countries are killing and persecuting Christians in the name of God. Just like Jesus said it would be. Yeah. Folks, it's just, you got to let that kind of sink in. These prophecies in this Bible are amazing. Yes. You don't get this kind of prophecy in a Quran. You don't get this in a Book of Mormon. You don't get it in the Hindu Bhagavad Gita. You don't get it in the Satanic Bible. You don't get it in the National Geographic. <laughs> this book is what it's all about. And as they persecute the quote-unquote infidels in these 12 countries that we talked about, they scream, Allahu Akbar which means Allah, their word for their God, is great. As they're doing it. In the name of God, they will uh, kill you, and they will think that they do God's service when they do it. Jesus predicted that 2,000 years ago. And it's happening. And the LGBT cult of liberalism, along with apostate Christianity, are becoming uh, equally dangerous threats to Christians in this country and around the world. Absolutely. Whoop, 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 whoop. Now I'm going to show you this. Um, I muted the video you're about to see because of foul language. But this was in Seattle, Pride 2013. This has been happening every year, but it's rarely caught on film. And this time, this there are others caught on film, but this is the best one I can find where these guys are standing with signs, and they're not just preaching against homosexuality, they're preaching against all forms of sin and calling on them to repent and believe the gospel. They're offering them free literature, free Bibles, and they are physically assaulted by cousin, uh, whatever his name is, uh, cousin Eddie. What's the guy in Adam's family I'm thinking of, the bald guy? It's Uncle Fester. Right. Uncle Fester, yeah. yeah. He looks like Uncle Fester, the other one guy. <laughs> And I don't know who this girl resembles, but uh, she's lit. And, I, <laughs> and she's the main reason I had to uh, mute it. She was F word and GD and everything you can imagine come out of her mouth. And uh, the one guy's trying to stop the girls, but then he turns around and gets involved. And here they take, they finally got a hold of the sign. They rip it down, trying to pull, pull out the guy's hand. Now watch this, here comes Fester and Dexter wow. beating him. Wow. Wow. That's disturbing. Wow. Which one won? Which one were you betting on? Well, <laughs> I'm betting on the cops, and you'll see why in just a minute. You know, this is why uh, it's, you know, important to be able to defend yourself. 
because when seconds counts, the police are only minutes away. But they do show up, and I don't think there's any more foul language from that point on, so I, I ended the meeting. And as you can see, they're going over to talk to Fester and his girlfriend. <laughs> He's right? dead, he don't care. Now watch this. Mommy, she got a little baby with her acting like that. Here's a little stroller. Somebody was watching her baby for her. Fester is getting a civics lesson from the police officer. So that's just one example of the, the uh, if you go down to Columbus, Pride Fest in June, and I've gone, I know many who have, and uh, Charity Baptist sends people down there every year, and they spit on them, and they throw things at them, and they cuss them, and they yell at them and everything, but uh, there's always cops around to keep it from getting that out of hand, so. Um, that's the, uh, the spirit of the pride. Do a Bible study on pride sometime. Pride. You know, the whole month of June is pride. God says he hates pride. And they increasingly harass Bible believers in the name of God. You say, wait, who are you talking about? Change the subject? No, I'm talking about the LGBT movement is more and more harassing Bible believers like us in the name of God. Well, like that guy that's Yeah, the guy running for president, Pete Buttigieg. And when they do, we obey Paul's admonition where we're told in Titus 1.13, this witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in faith. In other words, if they're claiming to be Christian or claiming to be religious or whatever, and you try to reason with them and they won't listen, you rebuke them. And that's what's not happening today, folks. Today's Christians have been taught love, L-O-V-E, means that you don't obey the Scripture. Uh -huh. Love means you never rebuke them. Love means you never offend them. And that's you're serving the Satan. You're serving Satan's interests. As long as you remain silent. When you look at, I don't care, it's not just, obviously, it's not just LGBT. It's, I'm talking about anybody who's lost. You're looking at somebody who's going to burn forever in a lake of fire. If you love them, you're going to want to urge them to repent toward God with faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ in that gospel. If you don't, if you know somebody who is in rebellion against God, I don't care if they're homo or they're a thief or just a habitual liar, or maybe they're a decent person, but they just reject Jesus Christ. If you love them, you're going to do what? You're going to tell them the truth. And if they then persist and begin to try to actually teach their view, that is against scripture, then you have to rebuke them sharply. Amen. You don't even have to raise your voice or anything. I'm not telling you to yell and scream. I'm saying you should just look at it and say, listen, you're preaching the doctrine of hell. And I didn't show, I, I've got screenshots. This guy called, he has a website. I believe it's the same guy on YouTube, at Gay Christian 101 is what he calls himself. And he came to my, our channel and replied said, uh, being gay is not a sin. And I responded, I said, uh, you're not a Christian. You're in, I'm, I'm paraphrasing my exact words, but I said, you're in rebellion. You're reprobate. You're damned. You're not gay. You're not happy. <laughs> and then he come back and said that he hated me with a perfect hatred. And I said, listen, I want everybody like you to hate me because their hate is based on simply me telling them the truth. Mm -hmm. And when they're, I told him this, when you're in hell forever, remember, I tried. That's right. mm -hmm. 
and that's what's going to happen to a lot of people. But sadly, what and his, I'm not saying this to be overly condemning. I'm not. I hope this doesn't come off as condemning. But I don't know who you talk to and how you talk to him. But I'm telling you this: if you've got loved ones who are gay, if you've got loved ones who are lost in any way, shape, or form, and you won't tell them the truth, then forever and ever and ever in hell. They are going to be screaming your name and saying, why didn't you tell me? Think of that. I'm not talking about the guy, you know, you go to the grocery store and you forget to give the guy a track that the cat, he was a cashier or something like that. Don't get nutty about it. But there are people you know and you've known for a long time and they're lost and you don't confront them. I've confronted people in my own family and then got other families mad at me for doing so. You know what I respond to them and tell them? Exactly what I just told you. If they go to hell, no blood on my hands, and they aren't going to be screaming my name for eternity, they'll be screaming yours. And I hope that keeps them up at night. We're to speak to them as reprobates. According to Romans 1, turn it there, Romans chapter 1, verses 24 through 28. And I just want you to, I'll read a couple verses, and then you can join me. 24 says, Wherefore God also gave them up. That's we say reprobate. God has given them up. How many of you heard that a person can be saved until their dying breath? No. Not true. The thing is, we don't know who that is, so we preach to people until they take that last dying breath. But the Bible makes clear here and in various other places. Go read Proverbs 1. Uh, which is across the board in every dispensation the way God treats people. God will hand you over and you're done before you die if you go so far. It says right here, wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness, to the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Why did he give them up? Not because of their sexual sin. Their sexual sin itself was a judgment. You realize that? Queer sex, as they this is what they like to call it, is judgment. Right here. God gave them up, and that's why they do it. That's what it says. Do we need to have a debate? Is that clear? God also gave them up to uncleanness. Through the lusts of their own hearts. He didn't put the lust there. To dishonor their own bodies between themselves. What? Here's why he gave them up. Who changed the truth of God into a lie. That's anybody who says it being, uh, you can be a Christian and be gay, for example. People who say you can be a Christian and not uh, believe in the gospel. There's churches out there that say, you know, well, you're a Christian by keeping the uh, Ten Commandments or you know, the Beatitudes, you know, that's, you're changing the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the creator who's blessed forever, amen. Worship the creature, meaning self, self-worship, self-love, self-ish, not shellfish, <laughs> selfish. <laughs> now read 26 and 28 with me. For this cause, God gave them up. Wait a minute. There it is again. Yes, ask the question. How many times God had to say something before people believe it? Read it again. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Stop there for a second. That's that loud mouth, uh, butch haired, purple haired soccer woman, whatever, with a peanut. Why is she so foul-mouthed, showing such disrespect to the president and the White House and our country, dropping the American flag on the ground so they can shake and 
carry on. You see that? It's not just trying. Why? Right there. God's giving them up. God's giving her up. Under her vile affections. She's a lesbian. Women change the natural use. Women were never intended to sexually pleasure another woman. It's unnatural. It's vile. It's what it's called right here. Vile affections. Verse 27. Read it with me. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving themselves that recompense of their error, which was meet. Uh, natural use of a, of a woman by a man is to be during marriage, a married couple, man or woman, and it's called sex. But it's heterosexual sex is what they call it these days. It's natural. Uh, I always tell, I was a youth pastor and youth leader, and they, some of the kids are always like, ah! because they didn't want to talk about it. I say, listen, you realize, as I told the young people, you realize you can have all the sex you want. You can have all the sex you want. And God won't be unhappy at all. As long as you're married. Get married. Have at it. <laughs> Amen. And it says in verse... 28, again, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Now, we preach the gospel, and if any, I don't care again, this isn't just the LGB, it's all the reprobates out there. If they turn on you and start blaspheming, and they reject the gospel and become vile, then you rebuke them. Amen. Preach the truth, and when rejected by such people, move on. You basically rebuke them and walk away. Yeah, trust me. That's when the cast not your pearls before swine must turn again and bring you. That's right. Yeah, that's true. Once you survey you says, hey. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> That's what Charlie was just quoting, Matthew 7, 6. Jesus said, give not that which is holy under the dogs. Now that's Jesus talking. He's mean. He would never call names. He just wanted a name caller. You know, anybody says that to me, it just tells me they're ignorant. They never read their Bible or didn't pay attention when they did read. Jesus was careful to only name call in ways in which it was true. So don't look at anybody and just say, you know, you're a poo poo head, you know, something like that. <laughs> Kids do do that. He also says, neither cast your pearls before what? Swine. That's mean. <laughs> Lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. Just as Charlie said. You touch her again. Now back to John 16. Go back to John 16 here. I'm going to read verse 3 again. Luke. John 16, verse 3. Read that again with me. And these things will they do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. Now, this text, the whole text we've read, verses 1 through 3, applies to all believers between the two advents of Jesus. This chart up here begins after the rapture. And then, I'm blocked by my little cord here, but right about here is the second coming. All that stuff happens in seven years, and during that time, this will be true as well, during that seven-year period. 
but it's been true for 2,000 years and it's going to continue pre and post trip. They kill Christians and think they do God's service when they do it. And we're, we're told that in 2 Timothy 3 12, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus, say that with me, shall, shall suffer persecution. The TV preachers sucker you by saying, if you just be positive and confess and name it and claim it and all that, you never have to be sick and never have to go through anything. That's just, if you buy that, you're what P.T. Barnum called a sucker. What do you say, Doug? Uh, is sucker born every minute? That's right. And, uh, man, you see these guys, even the small fry charlatans have limousines, Versace, Gucci, I mean, living it up. Why? Because the Bible says that the people gather to themselves teachers having itching ears. The problem isn't the teachers. The problem is there's so many suckers who are out there saying, what, remember Jeremiah said that they said, speak unto us smooth things. Yeah, that's the problem. So the idea that American Christians will not suffer persecution before the rapture is heresy. I say that, it, it, it is. It, it, heresy is a false teaching that causes discord and division in the church. And it is. And there are a lot of pre-trib Christians, people who think it believe in the pre-trib rapture, who believe it and they have this, I just have this space out look in, in their eyes when I talk to them a lot of times. They're like, oh, I just don't think that's going to happen to us before the rapture. <laughs> like, oh. <laughs> you know, a little, little more air in that head. <laughs> Because the Bible never says such a thing, but all you have to do is, again, read the news. Look around. Read history. Read the Fox's Book of Martyrs. Read the Pilgrim Church. Read the Church History by Ruckman. Read any of these. We've got a bunch of books in our library that will tell you all about that. But what they're, they're confused on, some of them are just confused, is that the Bible does say we will not suffer the wrath of God. That's why we believe the rapture happens before the tribulation period, before Daniel's 70th week. Because that's not about persecution. There's seven seals. White horse, red horse, black horse, pale horse. And then the, the, the souls of the martyrs cry out. Physical uh, changes. Uh, all this stuff. And then silence in heaven. And then the seven trumpets. And then you're going to have hail and fire and blood and a burning mount falling on the earth and wormwood cast in the sea and sun is smitten and the locusts that sting like scorpions and horsemen and voices and all that. And that's just the seven trumpets. <laughs> and, and on and on it goes. And all that stuff, that's all the wrath of God. And God's not going to put you through that. But before the rapture and before that starts... There's nothing that says we won't be persecuted. Because wrath is not the same thing as persecution. Wrath is God pouring out. You can picture him kind of, because it's like the vials pouring out. Persecution is not from God. Persecution is from the lost world. Yep. From Satan himself. So you have two different sources. Mm -hmm. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5 as we wrap this thing. 1 Thessalonians 5. It's in the Bible, isn't it? Sorry, <laughs> it is. <laughs> I, use a, <laughs> I use a different Bible when I'm studying at home, and then I use this with a big print, and that uh, you do get used to where things are in your Bible when you study it most of First Thessalonians 5, 6 through 10, not long verses, they're short, but uh, it begins verse 6 and says, uh, Therefore let us not sleep. It's talking about being spiritually in a coma. <laughs> As do others. But let us watch and be sober. That's why we're doing these studies. We're doing these studies to encourage you, to inform you, to make you a better watchman. 
And it says, verse 7, for they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. See, that the night speaks of ignorance. The night speaks of darkness and blindness. And uh, verse 8 says, but let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. Now read 9 and 10 with me. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. We have not been appointed to wrath. And that's why we're not going to be here for the wrath of God. We're not going to be here for that. But at times, we, here and now, are appointed to suffer. Do you know that? Some of you have been through it. Mm -hmm. uh, we're in First Thessalonians. Go back to page 2 in your Bible, chapter 3. Verse 1 starts, says, Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone, and sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. Read verse 3 with me. That no man should be moved by these afflictions, for yourselves know that we are appointed there to. See that? Paul is telling them regarding the afflictions that they were suffering at this time when he wrote this. They were appointed unto those sufferings. Jesus told the apostles that all but John would die. And John, and I mean die a martyr's death. And John died uh, at a ripe old age, but he suffered greatly. And he started on that Isle of Patmos and suffered, and that's where we believe he was given the book of Revelation. But this idea that uh, you can preach it if you want, but you're lying to people if you look at them and say, come to Jesus, he has a wonderful plan for your life. It might be a plan that requires you to die. It might be a plan like uh, uh, Johnny Erickson Tata. Mm -hmm. And she's 17 years old. And I think it was 1967. Oh, seven, a couple of years before I was even born. As a teenager, jumps in the pool and snaps her neck. Has been a quadriplegic since then, and is still alive, and along the way has fought breast cancer a couple of times. Now, what, well, I don't know about you, but I pray and say, Lord, thank you that that wasn't your plan for me. Amen. That's <laughs> just being honest. Yeah. But what was, well, you know, I've had some trouble. I've gone through some things. And I'll, I'll spend the rest of my life, since the age of 35 being diagnosed, and I'll spend the rest of my life fighting a lung disease and having nights where I can't sleep, can't really breathe. And, uh, but I know a lot of people had a lot worse than I did. What I've said is what I can imagine is kind of going through this without Jesus. Yeah. That's the part that I don't understand. Hmm. He's, he's my strength. I can call on him. At any time, day or night, if I'm in His Word, walking in the Spirit, praying without ceasing, I can sense Him. I can feel His presence most of the time. And at times where I don't feel it, I know it because of the Word of God. He says, "I will never leave thee nor forsake thee." Amen. But this. Bill of goods being sold to people saying, Oh, get saved, and God will just make your life wonderful. And you, you know, it's not necessarily. And, he's, and God never promised that. Men made that up. And what we ought, uh, I said, we ought not wonder at the persecution of Christians. We ought to wonder that it is not happening more than it is. 
because in a lot of countries it is happening more. Mm -hmm. And man, I had to really whittle this thing down to make it where we are. I did pretty good on time. Um, let this be a springboard. Go out and do your own research. Educate yourself on the persecution of Christians today. Jenny mentioned China. I mean, they. Yeah, Kim and I were talking about. Yeah, Chinese Christians are trying to get out of the country, and they uh, they find out you're having a Bible study, they just bulldoze your house and leave you, you know, destitute. Well, and there's no insurance. You don't get your house rebuilt. And they cart uh, the leaders off to prison. And um, some of the uh, Christians in China over the years have disappeared. And some people think that they killed them and harvested their organs, treating them like lab rats. Um, uh, you know, the, the encouraging thing is that uh, a lot of them come out of there saying, you know, the, the experience with the Lord and the way he comforts them gives them strength. It's like something out of the Bible or out of Fox's Book of Martyrs. Yeah, Jenny? Uh, I don't know. I thought this was interesting. So I talked with one of my students from China, and she's like, hey, what are some misconceptions or things you've heard about China? And I'm like, well, I've heard there's a lot of persecution there of Christians. She's like, what? No, there's not. There's no persecution. Yeah. Apparently she had Christian friends, and she says there isn't, so I'm guessing there's some kind of cover-up or... No, what or it is... Like, very basic Christians that they don't touch? Right. If you talk to your friend and mm -hmm. find out... I don't think she's a Christian either, so she... Exactly. <laughs> and what you'll find is there's there are a lot of nominal Christians mm -hmm. in China. Uh, in Russia, uh, I met a guy who told me the same thing about Russia. And the fact is that uh, Russian Christians are uh, being horribly persecuted. And the, and the Orthodox Church um, has, in, in a lot of the cities, got real good crowds and everything. But they did an internal survey, and 80% of the members of the Russian Orthodox Church are atheists. Mm -hmm. Why are they going to church? Because it's cool. And it's, a, you know, they have a good time, and the preacher doesn't get up there and preach like this. <laughs> so they enjoy it. Because, hey, man, if you're sitting there and you're not right with God, this kind of stuff, you know, just eat at you. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you get up there and he just talks about how wonderful uh, uh, Vladimir is and how wonderful the country is and how we ought to be proud to be Russian and that kind of thing. And that's what uh, Dan Bardwell, who's in Ukraine, will tell you about the Orthodox there in the Ukraine, where he's at. And as long as you go along to get along, then there's no persecution. It's called the Three Self Church. Mm -hmm. Millions of Chinese belong to the Three Self Church, and they're mostly atheists. But they uh, go to the church because it's a great social outlet and all that. And there's no persecution there. <laughs> but these are Christians in what we call underground churches. They have house churches and all that. They're the ones suffering persecution. And I don't know if she would say this, but uh, a lot of the Chinese would say, well, uh, you know, they're getting what they deserve because they're rebelling against the government. Yeah. See? Well, that's what Baptists and Bible believing Christians have always been accused of. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah, I had a couple of friends from Russia that moved to Belgium to escape. Well, they were Christian and they were escaping from Russia because how the politics are. Is. Yeah. You can't tell people what religion you are because yeah. most of them are Muslim in Russia. So, well, at least the people that she knew. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, yeah, they, they have laws against proselytizing. So if you discuss religion, with people, they can turn you in for proselytizing. And uh, that's going on in, like I said, China, Russia, North Korea is totally shut down. You know? but, uh, so do your own homework, uh, but just keep your eyes open. Uh, there's a ministry called Open Doors USA that has pretty good information. We stopped recommending Voice of the Martyrs when they built a $25 million headquarters. Uh, it is the end times. <laughs> so, um, but uh, we're trying to get find more sources, and we've got some books over here about the stories of people. And um, what was the one? Uh, we got the, the movie about the, uh, the Gates of Splendor. And, uh, 
these folks from Wheaton went to that cannibalistic tribe and they were killed. What? I should know that. I can't think of the names. Anyway, uh, <laughs> that's the kind of stuff you can. You, we have two or three videos on, on Christian persecution uh, in other countries and things. But read your own history, man. The reason why Thomas Jefferson um, included the, uh, or fought to include uh, this uh, Bill of Rights and the First and Second Amendments was because of the persecution of Christians here, right here in America. And right the year that we declared our independence, 1776, they were putting Baptists in Virginia in jail and uh, beating them and starving them and they, some died in prison and there's all kinds of amazing stories about Baptists and um, other evangelical type uh, Moravians was a big thing back then the Methodists who came over uh, suffering in America until the Constitution was ratified and all the states agreed to stop it and it's mostly due to what we call state church most of the persecution, like in Russia, they're in bed with the Russian Orthodox Church. China, in bed with the Three Self Church. When there's a church state union, that's why. That's all the Islamic. Ones. All the Islamic states are, we call it church state. They're mosque state or whatever you call it. Mm -hmm. uh, unions. And so whenever a religion jumps in bed with the civil government, then whoever isn't part of that religion, they come after you. Yeah. And that's why. Uh, Roger Williams was the first uh, Baptist uh, church in Rhode Island, established freedom of religion in the state of Rhode Island, and that was the model used for the United States of America, never done before in American or human history. And uh, you can thank your Baptist and evangelical forefathers for the right of freedom of conscience, freedom of religion, and uh, and very many Americans even know that today. Any other questions real quick? I couldn't want to ask him. Um, in Romans 1.24 where it talks about uncleanness, is homosexuality the only thing that falls into that category? No. Uh, I mean, there are uh, a number of things that fall under it, but it's uh, adultery itself is considered uncleanness. It's uh, you know, sex between a man and a woman in marriage. If you go with and you're having sex with somebody outside of that, I'm going to sound gross, but it is. On a physical level, it is unclean, and that's why God's... God, when God calls something unclean, there's usually a physical and spiritual reason behind it. And so um, there are people today suffering from sexually transmitted diseases because their spouse went out on them and brought it back into the marriage bed. It's unclean, it's filthy, and it causes death and, and sickness. That's just one example. And I don't want to go into this a whole lot, but bestiality... Mm -hmm. And bestiality has become a big thing. There are actually uh, tourist trips and vacation getaways for that purpose in various parts of the world. And that's how uh, they believe AIDS came in to, into the human population to begin with. Tourists going from Haiti to Africa. And I can't remember in, what, in that Eritrea. I can't remember what the country it was. Came back to Haiti and then spread it in Haiti, and then American homosexuals went down to Haiti having sex and brought it into America, and then it spread. And it spread through the homosexual community, largely, but then it got into the blood supply because our government was contr was controlled by the homosexuals. And so the homosexuals were, it was forbidden to test people, and so they gave blood, and they gave HIV blood, and Ryan White, the famous child who died from AIDS, who was a virgin, never had sex, <laughs> didn't shoot up with drugs, but he had a blood transfusion, and the blood came from a homosexual who had gotten HIV. And that's how it began to spread through the hetero population. And that's how it's continued to spread, is through homosexual sex um, and uh, intravenous drug use among all groups, including heterosexual, homosexual, and otherwise. And uh, so bestiality is at the back of not only that, but they think uh, other diseases. And uh, it's just going to get worse because they continue to have sex with animals all over the country, all over the world. So that's uncleanness.
Uh, by the way, that vile affections, again, in our Daniel study, we talk about how the Antichrist is called a vile person. And if you run the references, almost all the references to vile, V-I-L-E, refer to Sodom and a Sodomite. So that's why we believe the Antichrist is going to be a, a, a what? Yeah. Well, Sodomite, because he's not going to be happy. <laughs> John? Yeah, this, I guess I've forgotten. You know, you probably said this before, I've forgotten it. So, what was the, I guess, the overall idea about the 70 weeks? As far as, you know, why God picked 70 weeks, and obviously it was cut off, and now we're going to have one more. Like, well, originally, yeah, the uh, the amount of time that they were in Babylon was based on the fact that they skipped uh, 70 uh, Sabbath rest for the land. And so he gave them a 70-year um, rest by force on the land. And then Gabriel comes and says, there's coming another 70 weeks. And uh, as far as Gabriel saying he's going to do this because of that, I don't recall that. But we're just told to count down. And that's the amazing thing about that prophecy because, you know, we're told not to try to figure out the second coming, not to try to figure out the rapture. Only God knows the day or the hour. Well, only God knew the 70 weeks countdown until he gave Gabriel permission to tell Daniel, and then Daniel put it in his book. And so, uh, mainly, uh, our reason for being given the 70 weeks was uh, just as a matter of information, FYI. And it's one of the amazing things where God said, you know what, you do the math, you'll see, I told you beforehand. And because I told you beforehand, you know that I am God. And so, there's going to be a lot of people standing at the great white throne. And they're going to say, well, I, I don't see how you can hold me. I'm just guessing. I'm not saying I know for sure, but I'm just saying this. But I don't see how you can hold us accountable for not believing in you when you didn't really give us much proof to go by. <laughs> First, the creation speaks of the Creator. And this book gives you plenty of evidence, and that 70 weeks is one of the big ones that says this book couldn't have come from man. This book is from God, and so forth. Good question. All right, let's go ahead and close it up. If you want to stand, we'll have a word of prayer. And now you know the rest of the story. <laughs> We're not there. Number zero. Number <laughs> zero, oh, I don't remember that one. <laughs> uh, Brother Doug, would you close in prayer? Lord God, we thank you for this, this hour and uh, time that, that we spent together with a, uh, with a great lesson. And we just hope that we take this home and uh, uh, we'll review it to be good friends in the Word of God. And not, not just listen, but also uh, uh, absorb it, take home and use it and apply it. You know, it's, we thank you for this lesson. And uh, we, we hope for it. Safe trip home. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Right. In case you didn't know, Charlie got a haircut. Uh, crazy. His kid. This is myself. Hi. Hold on. There we go. This is myself. Hi, Hi Sel. <laughs> I love myself. Love everybody. We're not supposed to love ourselves. Well, you're the self I love, <laughs> not the Jenny self behind the camera. Oh, thanks for joining us. You're welcome. We actually still have 13 people. For those who are wishing to get a closer look, you're probably like, what in the world is on that screen? I can't totally see it. That's pretty cool. I'm going to have to read it myself. All right, hopefully. Yes. Oh.
Oh, did you want the onliners to see it, or? All right, onliners, looks like you get to watch a little extra. <laughs> Just don't go near Charlie. He explodes if he's on this stream. This is a problem, Martha. I didn't know that she would, that she had done this. And she gave it to me on Monday. And it brought me to tears. Because I had no idea she was going to do this. So, and what the surprise me is I had no idea what kind of it is. Mm. But it turns out that it's a Van Gogh. Oh, Vincent Van Gogh. Nice, good taste in art. It really shocked. Art right, shows the other side. Ooh, what's it say on the inside? Vincent Van Gogh. Nice. All right. Well, say farewell. I'm praying for you. I'll be praying at six thirty. I'll be on the bus, but I'll be praying. All right. Look, Grandpa, I got you the Echo Show. Alright, when we buy, this is Adidia, my awesome next door neighbor, this is my mom, my awesome mom. <laughs> Alright, bye onliners, see you later, we love you guys.